Welcome to another episode of Eric Waite Whiskey Studies and in this video we're going to look at the production of Springbank Distillery and do a review of the Springbank 15 year old. So I had the opportunity to uh, visit and do a tour of Springbank Distillery in July 2019 and if everything goes according to schedule I'll be back there in July 2024 actually uh, not just hearing about production but actually my hands on production uh, spending uh, five days going through the spring bank whiskey school really really looking forward to that because it's one thing to read about or hear about something it's another to at least get a little bit of experience putting your hands on you get a better understanding uh, of whether it's a, working in a winery or uh, in um, a distillery a better appreciation of uh, a whiskey or a wine um, and an um, understanding of what it takes to go from uh, grape to, to wine or from grain to whiskey so uh, before I get into this uh, here are my notes on production at Springbank Springbank distillery's water source is the Cross Hill Lock the distillery produces three types of peated and unpeated malt whiskey that it bottles under three distinct brands, Springbank, Hazelburn, and Longro. Springbank is the only Scottish distillery to perform every step in the whiskey making process from malting the barley to bottling the spirit. Several distilleries malt some percentage of their barley and source the balance from an industrial malting facility such as Port Ellen. However, Springbank maintains a traditional malting floor that provides for 100% of their distillate. Springbank dries its barley using peat sourced from Isla for various lengths of time, 30 to 48 hours, to imbue different levels of the smoky flavor associated with Scottish whiskey. Hazelburn receives 30 hours of hot air, Longro receives 48 hours of peat smoke, and Springbank receives six hours of peat smoke and 30 hours of hot air. Once dried, the barley is ground into grist, mixed with warm water in a cast iron open top mash tun to extract the barley sugars. The wort is then cooled and pumped into six boatskin large washbacks to ferment for 72 to 110 hours and produce what is now called wash. This long fermentation period allows for the formation of esters that shape the fruity secondary characteristics that help make the identity of the final product. The alcoholic wash goes on to stills for the distillation phase. Springbank uses three copper pot stills, one using direct fire, the other two using steam, used in various combinations to produce its malts. And its total production capacity is about 750,000 liters per year. Hazelburn, unpeated, is triple distilled to produce a lighter, higher ABV end product of 74 to 76% ABV. The medium peated Springbank is two and a half times distilled. During the distillation process, some of the low wines are collected before the second distillation and then mixed back into the faints for another distillation. This means that some parts of the spirit have been through the stills twice and some parts three times, hence the half distillation. The amount of spirit that goes through the half time is judged by the stillman as the process takes place to ensure consistency. It emerged around 71 to 72% alcohol by volume. The heavily peated long row is double distilled, leaving a heavier smoky distillate that leaves the still at around 68% alcohol by volume. The distillery employs traditional worm tub condensers, which limit copper contact and make for a richer, oilier spirit. The spirit is then aged primarily in ex bourbon and ex sherry casks, although Springbank experiments with a wide variety of casks to produce secondary characteristics that accent its house style. The Springbank 15 year old single malt Scotch whiskey. It's aged in 100% Oloroso sherry cask. It's non-chill filtered, has natural color. It's bottled at 46% alcohol by volume. And if you can find it at retail, it sells for about $130. Now, Springbank has gotten a lot of attention uh, because it is from 
uh, basically from grain to bottle. You know, everything's done in-house. Although barley, uh, they're not growing their own barley and they're not getting, you know, getting their own local peat. The peat comes from, um, uh, from, from Isla. But other than that, everything is done in-house and you don't see any computers. I think the only computers they have is at the registry when, you know, making a purchase or uh, perhaps, you know, doing the website and so forth. But in terms of production, uh, everything is done really, really old school. Uh, they keep track of everything with chalk and chalkboard and everything's, everything's really manual. Now, we can get very romantic about that and think that somehow if everything is more rustic and old school that therefore it's gotta be better. I can tell you, that ain't necessarily the case. I've been to a lot of uh, rustic, old school, family owned wineries and the wine was meh. So just because it's old school and we can get very romantic about it doesn't necessarily mean uh, that what they're producing is going to be better. Uh, sometimes having a lot of money and put a lot of expense into uh, high-end production equipment, what are you talking about? Lasers that can you know examine and evaluate each and individual grape that goes into a wine as they have an Opus One or high-tech equipment for producing whiskey when you have more control over everything to get exactly what you want. I appreciate, oh, it's old school. I appreciate, you know, family owned. I appreciate all that. But the standard of measurement of whether anything's any good, anything lives up to the hype is right here. Right here. It's what's in this glass. It's what's in this bottle. It's what I get on the nose when I get on the palate. Not, you know, that somehow they're, you know, small, you know, non-conglomerately owned, you know, they're not owned by Diageo, they're not owned by, you know, uh, Panad Ricard, they're not owned by, you know, uh, William Grant and Sons, they're not owned by, you know, on and on and on. Just because they're family owned doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be any better. Sometimes having a lot of financial backing can give you the, the tools, that give you everything you need, you can source the better cash, you can hire you know the better uh people to work in the stills to 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 manage everything you can get the more of the technology behind you so just being old school doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be better so what i want to look at is not in terms of the overall profile of this whiskey but i want to see does this whiskey live up all to the uh, uh, to all the hype uh, because a lot of my fellow whiskey tubers uh really go gaga over this whiskey all right on the nose So first off, this is 100% all roasted sherry cast, but it doesn't come across as your typical sherry. If you're familiar with, say, Glendronic or Bon Ave 12 or, uh, you know, uh, Avalar, you know, Abudna or you name it. In, in your well-known, your big sherry cast, this isn't that. The peat is really well interwoven. It has a distinctive uh, Campbelltown peat. It's not like Isla, it's not like Orkney, it's not like the Western Highlands, like Talisker, it is very distinct. There is a chocolate mint character, sort of like a York's peppermint patty. Uh, I think Rob, uh, Whiskey in the Six, he described it as uh, being like uh, mint chewing gum. I haven't chewed uh, mint chewing gum in years, but I have had a few York's peppermint patty recently. So I think I'm more of a, a mint patty than I do of chewing gum some dark dried black fruit notes um raisins some figs there's a definite spice going on there baking spices maybe a hint of black pepper cinnamon there's a little salty sea breeze on there dark caramels dried apples there's just a lot going on there and it's not every time i put my nose back to the glass i get something different so I can put my nose in here again and come up with something different. Put my nose in here, come up with something different. There's really a lot going on there. On the palate. Well, so I got the bottle down to the label. This is about, once I've had it you know, down here, I've had this open for a few weeks. By the time I get down to the label, I think I'm starting to understand the whiskey and, and ready to review it. The most amazing thing about this whiskey and the 10-year-old 
is the length of finish. I am still tasting it now. This is absolutely amazing. It has a huge evolution. You get, what you get up front, what you get in the middle, when you get into the finish is completely different. A little bit more of the uh, dried black fruit notes up, up front, maybe a little of that dried apple character. In the mid palette, that chocolate and the mint uh, kicks in. The dried black fruit notes, fig, dates, raisins, and there is this chocolatey minty character that carries on and I'm still tasting it now. The intensity of the smoke is moderate. It's not an in your face like uh, say Lafroy or Ardbeg or even some Lagavulins. It's somewhat moderate and it's interwoven with everything else uh, really, really, really well. So you don't have to fight through the smoke in order to get to everything else that's going on there. It's a little bit ashy, just a little bit, but not, not too much. I'm not kidding you. I've only taken one sip and I'm still tasting it. I could probably sit here for another half an hour and just uh, jibber jabber on at the camera and still be tasting it. It's got an unbelievably long finish, but let's have another. Twenty minutes later. This is a whiskey that needs some time. This is a whiskey that needs some time in terms of letting the, the bottle open. This is a whiskey that is better off sitting in the glass. If it's your, particularly if it's your first pour, let, let it aerate a little bit. This is a whiskey that don't rush this one. This is a whiskey when you're. It, this is my fire sign with a book whiskey. That's what this kind of whiskey is. You, you know, I get the fire going. You know, it's it's rather chilly here in uh, Half Moon Bay. Sitting next to the fire, you got a book, got a warm blanket or a sweatshirt and your bonnet on your head. You take a sip and you can put it down on the, the glass off to the side and you're sitting here reading your book, perhaps reading about Spring Bank Distillery or watching uh, whiskey tuber videos and it just, the flavor just goes on and on and on and on. This is an absolutely uh, superb whiskey. Um, in terms of the variation of flavors from front in the middle into the finish, in terms of the length of finish, in terms of the breadth and the depth of the mouth feel to it is absolutely uh, superb. I think some newbies may not necessarily grab onto this. This isn't like sort of your bright, fresh fruit, you know, character to it. Um, this is very sort of dark and danky, very, very earthy and very, dare I say it, uh, funky. But it's an absolutely uh, superb whiskey. Now, what I'm going to give in terms of a score, I'm going to go a solid 92 points, solid 92 points. What would I want to go e even higher than that? Maybe a little bit more richness in the mouthfeel, a little bit more richness in, in, in the mouthfeel. But on that, this is an absolutely superb whiskey. Uh, definitely will probably be on my uh, top 10 for uh, 2023. 20, uh, absolutely superb whiskey. Yeah, they're expensive and hard to come by and we're all been complaining about that. Um, but I would say if you can get one, I'd say 100 to $120 range, I'd say definitely pull the trigger because uh, this is absolutely superb. All right, uh, if you have not yet subscribed, if you like watching my videos, I would greatly appreciate if you would subscribe Ring the bell to be notified when I go live or post a new video. And until next time, cheers. Hey, don't forget to subscribe and check out these other whiskey videos.